I've been studying you all this morning. I've been trying to figure out who's a genuine morning person <laughs> and who got up in the middle of the night like I did. So, <clears throat> excuse me. When I was a child, my very favorite Bible stories were always the stories about Moses and the ancient Israelites. In my parochial school, there was always the annual unit that started with a baby Moses in his little basket floating in the Nile. And then we would get to Moses in the burning bush, and then Moses confronting the Pharaoh to let his people go, and then the 10 plagues that were visited on Egypt. Everybody loved these because they were so gross. And finally, that big moment, Moses held up his staff and the sea of reeds parted. It was a glorious day-by-day day adventure saga. Now, my teachers did not stop there. We kept marching with, with the Israelites right out into the wilderness. And so I remember today's story very well. Moses uses that staff again and strikes the rock, and water comes gushing out. I love this episode. I could always imagine it was just all this water. And I have to tell you, this is a digression, but I'm going to tell you because you deserve this. I love this story even more now. I recently discovered that Jewish legend has it that this rock rolled along with the Israelites for the rest of the journey. Seriously. I told this to the staff, the staff meeting a couple of weeks ago when we, we sort of lost it because we kept imagining a rock with little feet, you know, like a... <laughs> But I found out for sure, it's, I found a quote that said, no, it rolled. Okay, so the rock rolled along with it. But I digress. For my parochial school teachers, the lesson of these wilderness stories was what happens to people who are disobedient to God. That was kind of their generic message. I mean, the Israelites did get stuck in the wilderness for 40 years. So children, there's a lesson here. So well into adulthood, I would have said that the Israelites were a disobedient lot, a bunch of whiners and complainers who were always in trouble. I think that what most of us in our classroom took from the wilderness stories was kind of some smugness. I mean, we might get in trouble from time to time, <clears throat> but at least we weren't as bad as those Israelites, right? Now, I tell you all this because rereading Exodus this past week has been something of a revelation to me. Don't get me wrong, I remembered at least part of it correctly. At first glance, the Israelites do seem to be a bunch of whiners and complainers, as today's story demonstrates. The story of the rock and the water happens roughly six weeks after they have escaped Egypt. And for most of those six weeks, they have been complaining in ruthlessly sarcastic terms. It's actually kind of shocking to read how sarcastic they are. For example, <clears throat> as they stand at the Sea of Reeds just after they escape, and they can see that the Egyptians are pursuing them, they choose that particular moment to attack Moses. Hey, Moses, what? What is this? Weren't there enough graves in Egypt that you had to bring us out here to die? And then, of course, Moses lifts his staff, and the sea parts for them, and then swallows up the Egyptians, so they have a celebration. Then, a few days later, they come upon water that is bitter, and they start up again. So, Moses, what? What is this? We can't drink this stuff. And then Moses tosses that piece of wood that God shows him into the water, and the water is sweet <clears throat> and drinkable. And then, a few weeks later, the people are hungry, and they start up again, and then, you know, Pharaoh fed us, we miss Egypt, they say. And then God provides manna and quails to feed the people, and he even prescribes a weekly day of rest. And now, just a week after that happened, they can't find water, and once again they turn on Moses. Why did you bring us out of Egypt so you could kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? And given their ferocity this time, Moses fears for his life. The people, he tells God, want to stone me. And then, of course, God shows the way 
and there's water and more water for them pouring out of the rock that goes with them. Crisis averted again. But wow, you would have thought that by this moment the people would have a bit of faith in the process, wouldn't you? But no, no. They never believe until they see the miracle, and then they only believe for a little bit. After everything that has happened so far in this journey, their angry question to Moses is actually very shocking. Is God in our midst or not? But you know, it hit me. These people are not being disobedient. God doesn't treat them like they're being disobedient. They are out of control because they are terrified. And they are terrified because they cannot understand their own role in what is going on. Now think about it. The people of ancient Israel had lived for 400 years with their lives controlled by the whims of pharaohs. They had not had any say in any of it. And now they are saying to Moses, that actually they liked it better when Pharaoh was the boss because at least they knew what to expect. This new reality <clears throat> out in the middle of nowhere is utterly overwhelming. There are no certainties, and let's be honest, they still have Pharaoh in their heads. What they cannot comprehend is that Moses is not their new boss. He's not their boss at all. And weirdly enough, neither is God. They have been set free from their bonds. That is what is beyond comprehension to them. They have not learned how to be free. They have not learned how to trust that their God has made them partners in the enterprise of freedom that they are undertaking. And despite everything that God has done, they still can't find it in themselves to trust it. Pharaoh is in their heads. The ancient rabbis wrote bazillions of midrash on this, trying to understand what's going on with the Israelites in the wilderness. And I love the one that the 10th century rabbi Rashi explained. This is what he says is happening here. It's like this. A man is going on a long walk with his small child. The father places the child on his shoulders, and then for some hours they walk. If the child is hungry, he's given food. If thirsty, something to drink. All the child's needs are met. And then, after some hours, they meet another man, and the child says, have you seen my father? The point is that the child loses awareness of how his needs are being met. He has moved without any effort on his part. He is filled with food and drink without having to look for it. The father has become invisible to him. And so, of course, the father must take the child off his shoulders so that he can understand that he and his father are separate beings. In Rashi's story, the child is immediately bitten by a dog. Well, the child definitely sees his father then and turns to him for help. So it was with the ancient Israelites. Is God with us or not? Have you seen my father? That's the question asked by people for whom God has constantly met their needs but has become invisible. And so it's time for a reality check. As it happens, in the very next verses in Exodus 17, the very next ones after our reading for today, God gently reaches up and sets the Israelites off her shoulders and they get bit by a dog. They are suddenly attacked by Amalekites and what happens, well, it's up to them. Moses stands on a hill above them during the fight and he holds up his arms and when his arms are too weary, this is a famous scene, others hold up the prophet's hands. For as long as the Israelites can see the arms of Moses, they do well in the battle. But it isn't because God is intervening on their behalf. 
it is because they see Moses giving them God's blessing that they can do this for themselves. And I think that it is in these moments in chapter 17, these crazy moments of abundant water followed by a life or death battle, that the agonizing journey in the wilderness begins in earnest, the journey towards freedom in the presence of their God. Freedom means trusting that God has made a solemn promise to be there with them. Freedom means, not rights, it means taking responsibility for their part of the partnership. Two weeks after this, the people will arrive at Mount Sinai where God will lay out the terms of the covenant and God will say, this is what I promise you. I will be with you every single step of the way. And then God says, here are your instructions for what I ask for in return, that you commit yourself to live in freedom with each other so that everyone will have what they need. And for the next 40 years, God bless them, the Israelites will struggle in the wilderness to live up to the freedom that God has granted them. That struggle will go far beyond the years in the wilderness. It can actually be said that the Exodus story is a never-ending story. Can human beings trust God enough to live in a freedom that is defined by our responsibilities to each other? I don't want to get too far in the weeds today. I'm always tempted by the weeds, as you know. But I do think that one thing has to be noted here. The Exodus story is the foundational story of Judaism, of course. But also, and we must not miss this, it is much more. The Exodus story provides the blueprint for Western civilization. Exodus charts the course of the long historical movement out of slavery into freedom even as it also charts the human failures in attempting to live up to that freedom. One of the great gifts that were given to us by the Jews is that they charted the failures as well as the successes, so that we would know the failure was part of the process. The Exodus will inspire many things, but let's just say these. It will inspire our Puritan forebears as they attempt to create a covenanted community on the shores of North America. The Exodus story, told in spirituals, will convey the deep longing of slaves in this country for freedom. The Exodus story will be the inspiration for Dr. King and the civil rights movement, because if the arc of the universe bends towards justice, it is because God wills it to be so, and promises that the art can bend if human beings take responsibility for their freedom to to pursue that justice. The Exodus is not about what happens to this ancient people. It is a 3,000-year-old story that insists that the Almighty has a profound bias towards the oppressed, a relentless desire for justice, and a certain longing for human beings to take part in this movement towards freedom for all. In short, the Exodus story is just never over. It's our story as well. And it seems to me, a question I would ask, isn't it a particularly important story for us to embrace during Lent? It is not an accident that the most common metaphor for Lent is Wilderness time. The wilderness invites us to enter an empty space in which we can get some distance from the daily grind of our lives and confront the Pharaoh that lives in our imaginations and hoards all of our attention. We live in a time and place where there are just so many Pharaohs that rule our lives. If we are honest with ourselves, We know the names of those pharaohs. Perhaps it is the pharaoh that insists that all that matters is our own success measured by wealth and power. Perhaps it is simply the pharaoh that says that consuming more 
and more and more and more stuff will give us happiness, even as our relentless cons consumption lays waste to creation. Or maybe it's the Pharaoh that accompanies that, the one that says, don't pay any attention to the waste that is being laid. Don't pay attention to those who are still thirsty, those who are still hungry. Perhaps we live with more personal pharaohs, substance abuse, broken relationships, despair. Lent promises us this. Enter the empty space of wilderness. Let go of the pharaohs in our heads and find the sure answer to the haunting question, is God with us or not? And once we can see that the answer to that question is always, always, yes, we will find freedom. There's one more thing. Just like the ancient Israelites, we can find clarity in the wilderness, but just like them, we will more often than we like fail. And we will sometimes say that we simply cannot go on but there's good news here as well. It is in those moments of failure and abject despair that we are promised that we will be set upon the mighty shoulders of God for the next part of the journey. May we go on that journey. May it be so. Amen.